Hi, I'm Craig. Welcome to the Libra FM podcast, where we talk to authors, narrators, booksellers, and more. And I'm Karen. This month, we had the opportunity to sit down with Grady Hendrix, who is the author of the brand new novel, How to Sell a Haunted House. Grady Hendrix is awesome, Karen, I would say. Um, If you're not familiar with his newest book, which makes sense, it just came out. He has also written Horror Store, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Vampire Slaying, The Final Girl Support Group, among others. I have to say, spoiler alert, this was my favorite of his books, Craig. I loved this book. I agree. I've really liked Grady's books just because they're all very horror centric. I don't mean just that they're horror books. They're very like meta horror. Mm -hmm. They're like they're they seem like they're written for horror fans. I have to tell you, my favorite character in this book, I think about him still every day. (laughs) There is a puppet named Pupkin and I love him and I want everyone to read this book so we can talk about Pupkin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Karen, what about Pupkin do you like? I'm curious. Everything, first of all. But Pupkin also has a catchphrase, which if you keep listening, Grady Hendrix will actually say in his own voice. And it was <laughs> a highlight of my week. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, enough of that. Let's talk to Grady. Let's hear it from the man himself. Are you ready to start the interview, Craig? Uh, Kind of. Before we start the interview, I want people to know that um, I had a microphone malfunction during this episode where, for some reason, Zoom decided not to take the audio from my good microphone and decided to take it from my, like, $5 CVS headphones. (laughs) So it sounds fine, but it's not as good as a typical episode. But it is listenable, I've been told. I think it's fine. You're being too hard on yourself. Everything is fine. Don't worry. It's fine. Enjoy the episode, everyone. (laughs) Grady, it is so nice to meet you. Craig and I are thrilled to have you on the podcast today. Um, We've both read all of your novels and are big fans. Um, And for our listeners, we'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little about who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, I'm Grady Hendricks. I write horror novels. I'm actually in South Carolina right this minute where a lot of them are set, although this is the last one set in Charleston because I'm sick of talking about my hometown. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I live in New York these days and I, you know, all I do is write. That's it. It's the only skill set I have. Um, (laughs) You know, and I'm glad this worked out because I honestly, when I went sort of all in on this, it was like I was too old to do anything else. I'd been a journalist for a while and I was like, it's too late to go to law school. All I can do is type fast. So, (laughs) Well, I'm glad it worked out for you. God, me too. (laughs) Well, speaking of it working out, congrats on the release of the new book. Um, We both got it and our... We both loved it. Um, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, It only came out January 14th, right? Um, Yeah, it's just January 17th. Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't even think it's a week old yet. I think today it's a week old. Today it's officially a week old. Um, But yeah, and it's also, this book is like, it took a long time to land this one. And um, my editor and I both were kind of like, it's weird. It's kind of small and personal. We're just not sure. You know, we'll we'll do better next time. And so it was really wild that people are, to me, that people are connecting with this book at all. Yeah, I, I told Karen, so I had read, I think, all of your other books. And when this one came out, I was intrigued by the name and ended up, honestly, I think it's my favorite book so far. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. How's it feel for it to finally be out after the, the slog to get to here? really irre- unreal because usually my books take about a year. You know what I mean? From the time I start it to the time it hits stells. So about a year. And this was been like 18 months because okay. I just could not crack this book and needed more time. And so I've lived so long with this book as a file on my hard drive that my editor and my agent read that it's weird that other people read. I feel like someone's looking in my underwear drawer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so glad that you wrote it. We're glad that we have it. We are happy to look in your underwear drawer. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Craig and I both love horror, um, but I will admit that I'm specifically a little bit of a wuss when it comes to hauntings. And so as we were preparing for this, I'm like, 
am I going to make it through this book? Am I going to have a meltdown? Uh, will I be okay? And I absolutely loved it. Um, oh, thank you. And one of the things that like really anchored me throughout it and made sure I, I didn't have a terrified meltdown was that there's so much humor in this book. And I, I thought I feel you were like going to say Jen. <laughs> <laughs> there's humor, I feel like is such a hallmark of your writing. And I think it's really unique to see that with straight up horror. Um, and so I'd love to hear a little bit more about like how that came to be, how that's so important to you um, and where your how your writing style for novels evolved. Um, well, so I kind of write like I write, like it's, it's, it's sort of the only way I can do it. Um, and so I really, and, and the, the thing that's evolved, well, I really feel like I, I can only write about what I see around me. And so I, I'm not doing science fiction or fantasy or anything that's secondary world. Cause I'm just not that guy. That's not my skill set. Um, I need, I need a, a model, like the reality model around me to sort of like see that and then focus on it and have something to pull from. So horror fits me pretty well. And the thing that's changed the most in my writing, like if anything's evolving, is I'm, I'm really minimali- minimizing my style. Um, I, I'm, I'm becoming more and more an advocate of, I think when people read my stuff, they want my writing to be a clear pane of glass that they look through to see the story and the characters. And I just want to be as invisible as possible. Like, you know, you read Charles Dickens and I love Dickens. Like it's such a nerdy thing to say. And I'm, I feel <laughs> precious, but like, but he is, his authorial voice is really front and center. That narrative voice is really strong. And I feel like with me, I'm aspiring more towards the, and you know, you read someone like Shirley Jackson, where it's so precise and so fine tuned that it's kind of like, you're like, Oh my God, this canoe I'm in is like, beautiful like the way the wood joins it the grain just goes you really might and, and i'm leaning more towards i think a stephen king where like you just want to disappear you know what i mean you just don't want anyone noticing your prose and getting into the story and i found that that the more i do that the better it works awesome i love that you said that um craig mentioned a couple <laughs> of times as he was reading this book craig is a huge stephen king fan and said this reminds me of stephen king i love it oh thank you <laughs> yeah, i specifically like early stephen king like the kind of like absurdity of some of the scenes i was like oh my god i'm loving this oh thank you yeah i did a thing where um i wrote a stephen king reread for tour years ago and i started out just like oh i'll do the first 10 books and i wound up doing the first 34 or so uh, it took me five years and it was, it had a huge impact on me just to be able to, to you know, I, I, I did the first one right before I signed the car, contract to write horror store, which was my first horror novel in 2014. And I finished the, the reread in, um, gosh, tw- right around the time I won the Stoker for paperbacks from hell. And so a few months after that, so it was about a five year span. And so it, I, it was a huge change in my life. You know, like my life was changing an enormous amount in my, my work. And the one constant thing was reading these big fat Stephen King novels. Um, and I really like, I, I developed this little internal Stephen King who lived in my head, um, and, and That's talked terrifying. to me and he was, he was, no, he was a real comfort actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so it, it was, it was one of the, it's one of the best uses of my time. Thanks for mentioning Horror Store, because it sets me up perfectly for this question. Um, So a lot of, like I said, I I read and watch a lot of horror, and a lot of the settings are like a big gothic mansion or or like a cabin in the woods or, you know, spooky places. And one of the kind of parts of your books that I love is that they tend to be set in kind of more like regular settings, you know, like a a book club in this, like a suburban setting, or like, I know it's not Ikea, but like an Ikea type store. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's mostly yeah. Ikea, 99% yeah. <laughs> Ikea. What is it about those regular mundane settings that you find compelling? It's where we live. Um, I am astonished at how ugly the world is sometimes. You know, we have built an enormously ugly habitat for ourselves. Um, you know, I, I love it. I'm fascinated by it, but, but going through subdivisions and strip malls and, and, and downtown urban revitalization districts and all this stuff. I mean, you see the same McMansions cut and pasted the same, um, storefronts, the same, and it's really weird. And, and, and I love it. It's, but it's very anonymous. It's very strange. There's one of my favorite horror movies of all time. It's this 20 minute short called, um, 
might even be shorter than that, called Unedited Footage of a Bear. And it's on YouTube. Adult Swim produced it. And it starts as a pharmaceutical commercial and just sort of devolves into this suburban nightmare. And it makes, and there's another one the same person did, the same team did called This House Has People in it. it they really maximize that, those sort of, those sort of blah suburban spaces that take up so much of our lives. And there's this idea of, of liminal spaces, right? Spaces that are in between. They're neither here nor there. Um, there's a great horror short on YouTube called Back Rooms. Uh, make sure you get the original Back Rooms. Um, but it's really good. But it's just, you feel like you're in a conference center. And there's an amazing Twitter video someone sent out where they got lost. They were staying at a hotel that had a conference center attached and a convention center. And they decided to take a shortcut through the back of house stairwell and they got lost and they just started filming it and sort of how insane these, these almost cut and pasted environments were. And we really, that liminal space used to be so important in horror. It's neither alive nor dead. It's neither here nor there. It's the house by the cemetery. It's, you know what I mean? And now we've turned everything into this liminal space. It's a where I, I work from home. I, I, you know, I live over a store. I, I live in this manufactured neighborhood where I can walk to my favorite coffee shop and a business. We've created a world of spaces that aren't here or there, and they're very uncanny, really uncanny. That's that is so true. I'm like picturing neighborhoods I've grown up in now, and I'm like they are. They are eerie in their own unsettling way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mom lives in this little subdivision. It's just a single loop. And um, when I'm there, if I'm on the phone, I'll walk loops around the loop. And um, at night when you're doing that, especially um, in the winter when no one's out, you just start noticing like the similarities between the houses and it becomes very, very eerie. Um, I, I just... And so, you know, this is where we live. It's what we've built. It's what we've designed. I feel like we're building towards some kind of Lovecraftian superstructure that we're all just trapped in and non-Euclidean angles. I thought the answer to this question was going to be like funny. And I was like, I'm going to ask him about Ikea. And then it ended up being like, oh, I need to move to the woods now. I'm depressed. Well, you know, that Ikea, you know, all Ikeas are laid out on the same general floor plan. And so I wrote the book and I'd spent a lot of time in an Ikea and about, you know, the book comes out like 10 months after I write it or so, somewhere in there, six months. And I don't go to Ikea. There's one in New York, it's in the middle of Red Hook, which is Nowheresville. And um, some reporter thought it'd be fun to do an interview in an Ikea. And I'm like, oh yeah, sounds fun. Well, I'm not going to say no to publicity. And so I went there <laughs> And of course, it's laid out like the Ikea or the Orsk in my book, which is laid out like an Ikea. And as we walk through it, I'm like, I started to get panicky. Like, I'm trapped in my book. I'm trapped <laughs> in my book. Everything. And I made some excuse halfway through. I'm like, oh, let's do this out front. This will be so much more fun in the fresh air. Oh, my God, I'm dying on all these plastic fumes in here. And really, I just wanted to get the hell out of there because I was starting to like you get before a little the bit of a panic. Came, you know? Yeah. <laughs> before, while I still could. Yes. <laughs> Well, Grady, I have some puppet questions for you. Who um, doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've been talking about this a lot lately. Um, I am obsessed with Pupkin. Pupkin is, oh, in my you. mind, just an incredible star of the show in your new book. Um, can you tell us if there was any inspiration for Pupkin? Um, how did this incredible pu puppet come to be? <laughs> yeah, no, this is, um, Pupkin is based very closely on Snokio, who is my wife's childhood buddy. He kind of appeared in her crib when he was, when she was two. Um, and she's had him all her life. And, um, Snokio is a unique individual who provokes a strong flight or fight response when people <laughs> meet him for the first time. Uh, but he's with us to this day. Um, and he and I have a good understanding, you know, we're, we, I get along with the little guy, but I sometimes forget his qualities when someone new comes over and they're like, what the hell is that? You need to get rid of this immediately. <laughs> I, I am scared for you. Yeah, no, but he's great. He's, you know, and Pupkin in the book, Pupkin's just misunderstood. He just wants it's to true. have a good time. Um, and there is a wild difference between marionettes and hand puppets. Like marionettes are very stately and elegant. Hand puppets, man, they are out of control. Um, Punch from Punch and Judy started as a marionette. 
and they migrated him to a hand puppet and he that's when he became like the puppet that beats his wife to death and throws the baby out the window and you know basically is a is a force of anarchy in the world interesting a follow-up question pupkin has a catchphrase well pupkin has several catchphrases but there's kind of like a trademark kaka way way <laughs> Although I've Thank also you. heard kaka wee wee, which is fine with me too. I think he would say it either way. Tomato, tomato. That's the way Karen and I have been saying it for a month. <laughs> but you answered oh, yeah. my question. I was wondering if you could pronounce it for us so I could make sure that when I yell it several times a day, I am saying well, it so you all have been doing kaka wee wee or kaka wee wee? Uh, wee wee. Okay, I'm going to go with kaka wee wee because for the audio book, they ask you to, uh, and I think they go with kaka wee wee in the book. They, they so, do yeah. in the audio book and it's amazing yeah good <laughs> okay i'm gonna funny. just do that from now on yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that's the audiobook should guide the way um this next question can be fast but i i live in boston so i appreciated that a, a portion of the book took place here i found myself being like i know where that <laughs> is one thing i didn't that i did not know where it was was this supposed big underground puppet scene in boston is this it exists or it used to i was gonna ask is this real or fabricated Oh, yeah. So I worked for a radical puppet collective back in the early 90s, and it was in Boston, and Boston was puppet central because the big political puppet company in the United States is Bread and Puppet out of southwestern Vermont, out of, I think, Burlington. Uh, Burlington? Somewhere around there. Yeah, and people will work for Bread and Puppet and go off and start their own companies, and often the next big city they migrate to for a theater scene is Boston. And Boston used to, in the 90s, sort of before all this stuff got cut, had a great arts funding. Uh, you know, the state in Massachusetts and the city of Boston had a lot of funds available for the arts. And so it attracted a lot of companies. And of course, you'd get a, a puppet company and then a puppet company would split off from them and one would split off from them. And I spent so much of my time in unfinished basements in the back rooms of bars watching puppet shows when I was there. Um, so yeah, to me, Boston is Puppetville. Awesome. I was going to say the description seemed too real. I was like, this has to have been from something. So I'm glad to know that it's basically yeah, early just 90s. your experience. Awesome. I, I just nice. moved to a, a small town in Michigan and I, I haven't been here long, but I noticed walking around, there is a puppet company here. So I'm going to have to, there's a storefront for it. So I'm going to awesome. go learn more. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to learn more. Uh, <laughs> I'll bring my own pumpkin. <laughs> well, it's funny. The original draft of this book um, revolved around a puppet cult in southwestern Vermont because uh, I went to school there for a year in Bennington. And um, so I would just say, watch out for that puppet company in case they turn out not to be a puppet company, but a puppet cult. <laughs> Well, Grady, for this next part of the podcast, so Craig and I have been doing this the last few episodes where we ask our guests a series of lightning round questions. Um, I'm in. It, it, it could be about anything or everything. Uh, no need to think deeply about these. I think we've got five or six and we're just going <laughs> to rapid fire them at you. Come at me. Come at me with a question. <laughs> All right. Do you think ghosts are real? Yes. Define, well, you have to define ghosts and you have to define real, but within those parameters, 100%. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, would you rather live with Pupkin in his crazed, violent state for one year, or would you rather never eat your favorite food again? Never eat my favorite food again. Oh, interesting. What would that food be? Out of curiosity. Oh man, I this is embarrassing. So um, I'm a Southerner, and um, I, as a Southerner, mayonnaise is one of your favorite food groups, <laughs> one of the major ones. And so mayonnaise and all is from deviled eggs, yep. pimento cheese, all that stuff. I I can't have it in the house because I will eat it all. Um, so if I had to do without mayonnaise or any mayonnaise product for a year, that's still preferable to living in a situation where pumpkin slowly s s overwhelms my personality until there's nothing <laughs> left but pumpkin. <laughs> a solid answer. <laughs> yes. In the book, the brother and sister have this tradition. I mean, their family has their tradition, pizza Chinese, which mm. absolutely stealing. Love this. I'm curious, do you have any family food tradition? Well, they don't need to be mayonnaise related. Yeah. We don't really. My mom was a bit like Nancy in the book, a, a very enthusiastic. More than she wasn't very enthusiastic. She was a terrible cook. Um, and so 
uh, I don't really, but, but one tradition my wife and I used to have is we lived in a neighborhood in New York and the Chinese takeout place, and it was an old school, you know, bulletproof barrier that's all scratched up in front of the register. And, you know, they did like chicken wings and, you know, um, that kind of stuff was along with Chinese food, real traditional. But one thing they had on the menu and we were like, when we first saw it, we were like, what were pizza rolls, which were pizza toppings stuffed inside an egg roll wrapper and deep fried and they were a dollar fifty and they were amazing and we sounds amazing we ate so many of those when we lived there and in fact there was one really embarrassing day when we were maybe on substances and we <laughs> ordered delivery three times from that place which was literally <laughs> across the street from us and each time our order was six pizza rolls and the guy was so <laughs> sick of seeing us by the third time <laughs> oh that's amazing i love that um what is the scariest movie you've ever seen uh martyrs the french movie martyrs craig before we mentioned that today. this call i said that's I've heard that's like the scariest movie. And I was like, I need to see this. So it's so funny that that's your answer. Oh, dude, it is, you know, go into it without any expectations. Take it for what it is. It is intense. All right. Well, now that I've had a good friend of mine and Grady Hendrix tell me that it's the scariest movie they've ever seen, I my my terror level is... <laughs> well, you know, um, so there's a quick story. Um, I saw it at the Toronto Film Festival. I, I, I've got family in Toronto. And um, and so they have this midnight slot and they showed Martyrs at midnight. It was about 1,100 people in the theater and the lead actresses were there and the director. And before the movie, one of the actresses was like, I don't want to be here. She's like, I'm only here because I have to by contract. I don't like this movie. I don't like the way I was in it. I feel exploited by this film. Wow. I... The end. And the movie goes, someone passes out during the film, someone threw up, um, and, and 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 a fight broke out in the Q&A section, like two people yelling at each other. And at the end of all of this, that actress got back up, and the director of the, the program was like, how do you feel about the movie? And she's like, you know, this is the first time I've seen it with an audience. like really. And she's like, you know, and I feel better. She's like, I still don't like this movie. I, I, I still don't like it, and I wish I hadn't done it. But seeing people engage with it and like really engage beyond the fights and the throwing up stuff. She's mm -hmm. like, okay, this is, this is a work of, this is a work of something. And I, I guess I'm happy to have participated in that, but I still wow. didn't enjoy it. Like, yeah. Wow. So prepare yourself, but also <laughs> don't let anyone hype you up too much. Go in cold. Okay. <laughs> he said after hyping you up relentlessly for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm absolutely going to watch that. Um, I saw in your Instagram bio that you say you own way too many paperbacks. And I would guess if you had to put a number, if you had to guess how many you own, how many do you think you have? I Okay, I can't put a number on it, but um, I have, let me guess, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and that's 12. And then there's six and six. So 12 plus six is 18 and then you're going to add three more 21 and then two so 23 you know those banker boxes people have like with the lids on them mm -hmm. 23 boxes of them uh oh my God. yeah so when you were counting i was like is he gonna count them all <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, we're starting at one <laughs> yeah that, that must have seemed insane like five hours <laughs> later 583 oh no 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 that's a that's two volumes so, yeah so 581 <laughs> Perfect. All right. Last lightning round question. Um, is there anything you're able to share with us about Horror Store, the film? Oh, yeah. So it's got a director attached. We are um, taking it out to studios. I did the screenplay. Um, I want to have words with whoever wrote this book because there are some deep structural problems that I had to deal with, which were not fun to handle. Uh, excuse me. And, um, and you know, and funnily enough, not that you asked, but I just like I love talking. Um, one of the hardest things to show on screen, almost impossible, is someone thinking about something or someone making up their mind. And the two big moments in Horror Store are Amy trapped in the chair, thinking about her horrible life and basically giving up, and Amy decide making a big decision. And because they can't do those on screen, the movie has a lot of differences in it because just to fix those two points requires so much heavy lifting, but it actually wound up somewhere I think is, is not bad. 
Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. When will when will be, we be able to watch it in the public? <laughs> I don't know. What we're really hoping is, I don't know. I don't want to say it and jinx it, but it's close. I mean, I think of the next two years, hopefully. Very cool. Nice. Oh, I can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Me too. I just want to walk around the set. Oh, that's going to be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> And then be like, actually, never mind. I want to go outside. <laughs> Help me. <Yeah. laughs> yes. that people are going to be watching the movie and see me wander by in the background going, how do I get out? <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> Our last part of the podcast that we usually end with is what we call Instagram story time, where we look at the guest Instagram and pick one photo and ask for the story behind okay. it. Okay. And for you, it's your newest photo, unless you've posted in the last two days or something. Oh, what's the... But it is, you posted a photo of all these things pasted up on a wall. Oh. You called it your wall of crazy. And I would love for you to explain to us and the listeners what the wall of crazy is. So I live in a one-bedroom apartment with my wife. And one of the things that will lead you to a divorce very quickly is trying to write books in a one-bedroom apartment with your spouse. (laughs) And so when I did Horror Store... um, I started renting an office space and it's tiny and it's, it's pretty, 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 um, uh, it'll keep you anchored. Like I don't have famous, like, one side of me is a driving school. The other side of me are people who process medical bills across the hall for me is a passport office. Like it's, it's pretty down and dirty, um, which I love about it. Uh, <laughs> and it's tiny, uh, no window, but, and I, and I, I but I'm paying, I paid a little too much for it. And so one of the things that was nice is like, I had to like make my nut every month. I had to pay for this office. So I was like, I got to keep writing. And I realized, well, if I've got this space, I'm going to indulge myself. And what I always wanted was I'm going to pin up all my reference on the wall over the desk. And it became, three things came from that. One is it became a nice ritual. I'd start a book and the wall would go up. And the day the manuscript's accepted by my editor and there was no more writing to be done, it all comes down. The other thing is, it's really nice to have the reference right in front of you, like clothing reference and cars and things like that. Like, I can just sit back and sort of be like, okay, okay, this is the minivan they're in. And uh, it looks, I don't know, it looks like it would be a dinged up. Oh, I bet like a lot of trash piles up in there. So that's always really nice. And then the third thing is, sometimes stuff goes up that doesn't work, but it'll stay up until another book. And like, I have this photo that I put up around my best friend's exorcism of a little girl walking up a flight of stairs with a a rubber mask of an old man on. And it just never popped up in a book. And other things would pop up from books or last for a book and then be used in the next one. And um, and finally, that became the real um, sort of part of the inception point for how to sell a haunted house. You know, the idea of a little kid wearing a mask of an old person. and so, yeah, so it it just became such a great resource. And actually, I'm moving offices right now. So the walls come down, but I'm working on my book for 2024. And I feel lost without my wall, which is like the most precious thing for a writer to say, like, I need my wall. <laughs> I, I would suggest that listeners go find this photo because it is very clear why this does not belong in your one bedroom apartment <laughs> with your wife. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, before we let you go, Grady, um, our very last question for you, do you have any recommendations for our listeners in terms of uh, things you're reading or listening to right now? Yeah, I mean, okay, so twofold. Um, There is a podcast I'm going to recommend that I don't want to recommend, because I want to steal it. And I actually tried to get in touch with the guy who runs it to, to, to option some of it. It is genius and it's not very popular and it doesn't get updated anymore it's called you are haunted and it is um listeners uh send in hauntings but they're not listening it's him he writes all of them uh and they are funny and some of them are actually kind of fascinatingly chilling um there's just to give you an example there's one and, and they're usually quick they're, each episode's about 16 minutes and there's usually three stories in there but there was one that's about um, these kids who are playing with a Ouija board. And one of them has an uncle, Chris, I think, who had, who had passed away. And they, on the Ouija, they get crit, they get uncle Chris. And they're like, oh, how and he just says over and over again, it's dark, I'm scared. It's dark, I'm scared. Help me, help get me out of here. And, and 
it, he just repeats it over and over and they get kind of like, okay, okay, this is, let's, we're done with this. And they're like, but you have to like, you know, that legend that you have to sign off of Ouija board. So they're signing, and he's like, no, don't go. Don't leave me here. Please, please, please don't leave me here, please. And then they hang up on him and Uncle Chris is in hell forever. Oh and it's, oh, they're so good. Um, I'm in. And, this sounds great. <laughs> and then the other yeah. thing I'm going to recommend, also a listening thing, is this one takes a little hunting because I don't think there's a podcast for it. But there used to be, I don't know if you guys know a, a sound audio guy named Joe Frank. But Joe Frank, he used to be on some public radio stations. He started out to around Boston and ended up in L.A. And I used to work at a Tower Records in L.A., Tower Video, actually. And I would drive home and on Sundays, I'd go in for my shift and there was this bizarre show. And I was, I could not figure out what was going on. And it was, it was like a call in, but they were talking about like, um, uh, uh, people who turn their cars into living into sculptures, but then the sculptures would fall off on the interstate and people would hit them and die. But that was part of the art. I was like, what is this? And Joe Frank, he is a storyteller and he just makes these hour, hour and a half long audio pieces. And some of them are these sound collages kind of things. Some are scripted and there's, you know, people talking and call-ins and things like that and the answering machine messages and all this all fabricated. And some are him just talking. And Joe Frank is a genius. And it is, you may listen to one and it's not your thing. Try another. Um, some of them are heartbreaking. Some of them are fine. Some of them, they're all just weird. Um, but they are really worth taking the time to find it. He passed away several years ago and really never got, he was always recognized, but never was able to sort of cash in on his, his, this small amount of fame. He had and also audio. Like, who cares? This is America. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we're not England with the BBC radio. Like, we don't care. This is a really good way to end the podcast. I'm <laughs> no one cares. Um, yeah. But yeah, but Joe Frank is really ripe for rediscovery, I think. Um, and it's even arrogant of me to say rediscovery. I think he never went away. But Joe Frank and you were haunted. Those are my two big recommendations. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad I saw Craig writing them down on a post-it note. So <laughs> we will be listening to both. <laughs> yes. Craig is holding up the post-it note, listeners who can't see this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Grady, thank you so much for the time and congratulations again on the book. Um, no, thank you guys for having me and, and putting up with my, my nonsense. <laughs> no, it's great. I have so many recommendations. Hot sauce, um, <laughs> po new podcast Lau movies. Ma. It's Lau great. Ma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Bye, you guys. Bye, Grady. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to our interview with Grady, everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed that. I will never get over finally hearing the author pronounce kakawiwi, pumpkin's catchphrase. I was surprised that he pronounced it not kakawiwi. We actually helped him decide how it's pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the it's the right answer. It's just the right answer. I I agree. I'm thinking about setting that as my ringtone on my phone. Wow. Him saying that. Yeah. I think you should not do that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. You're going to be in a weird situation where that goes off and you're going to be unhappy. I don't think I will. I think I'll be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Craig I would like to know what you are currently reading. Please tell us. Are you making me go first? Okay. Um, yeah. I am reading. I actually have a funny story about this, or it's mildly funny. <laughs> I'm reading the new Brandon Sanderson kind of standalone novel, but it takes place in the same universe as all of the other Brandon Sanderson things, um, like Mistborn, et cetera, which, you know, I'm a big fan of. It is called Tress of the Emerald Sea, and it is Ooh. so good. It's very really? funny and like quirky, and I'm loving it so far. My mildly funny story is that I went into my local bookstore, the Brooklyn Booksmith, everybody, um, and I walked up to the bookseller and I said, I actually literally held up my phone and showed them the Libro app and I was like, do you have this book? And they were like, <laughs> oh yeah, let me check. And they're like, click, 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 typing on the computer. And they're like, hmm, I can't find it. Hold on. What's the thing again? And they search it. And they were like, this book doesn't come out until April. 
And I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, uh, I think I have it as an ALC. And then I ran out of the store embarrassed. Oh, well, you could have used that opportunity to say you bookseller at Brookline Booksmith, you too could be listening to this ALC. <laughs> Are you enrolled in our ALC program? <laughs> I did not do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love Libro. I am an ambassador, but I was red faced and ran that's out of the room. The second time that's happened to you, because I remember you were <laughs> listening to the new Kevin Smith book. Now is not the time to panic. And you said. His name's Kevin Wilson. Oh, uh, my Kevin gosh. Smith wrote <laughs> Clerks. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So I have to quit my job now, everyone. It's been it's been a pleasure. Um, However, you you said, I'm going to the bookstore to go purchase this right now. And I said, best of luck. It's not out yet. <laughs> yes. It hasn't been yes. published yet. <laughs> um, the other thing that I just reread is True Biz by Sarah Novick because we just recorded a podcast with her. And it was so fun to get to reread that book and talk to her again. Yes, I reread that as well for the podcast. And I love that book. It was so cool to talk to Sarah. We have an interpreter um, with us in the video recording that we made of that one. So really, really excited for that episode to come out. Yeah, this will be our first episode that we ever put out as a full video, not like a... <sighs> I know I'm nervous too. So anxiety inducing. Yep. People will know what we look like. <laughs> I have a face for podcast, Karen. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite joke. Um, no, it was an amazing, awesome interview. I, Sarah is a gem. Agreed. Agreed. Besides True Biz, what are you reading? Oh, I just started a new book. Um, I got it from my local library recently. It's brand new, I think. It's called The Survivalists, and it is by Kashana Colley. It has a blurb from Samantha Irby on the cover, and... If you have ever read anything by Samantha Irby, you will know how funny she is. So I was delighted to see a recommendation right on the cover. Um, I'm going to read you the tagline for this book. Lay it on me. A single black lawyer puts her career and personal moral code at risk when she moves in with her coffee entrepreneur boyfriend and his doomsday prepping roommates in a novel that's packed with tension, curiosity, humor, and wit from a writer with serious comedy credentials. Sold. It's Take awesome. my money. I'm buying this <laughs> it's book. It's really good so <laughs> far. I cannot put it down. That is what I will be doing the rest of this evening is smashing through this book. Um, that is The Survivalist by Kashana Kali. Love it. Cannot wait. Well, folks, if you would like to read the new Grady Hendrix book, How to Sell a Haunted House, or any of the other things that were mentioned on the podcast... Uh, you are welcome to sign up for your Libro FM membership using our special promo code Libro Podcast, and you will get an extra free credit when you start your membership. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>